if, uh, Stephen, whilst you're resuming your seat, can I also just thank you for the wonderful hospitality I've enjoyed with uh, you and your team at the Institute over recent weeks. I've really appreciated that. Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see such a good crowd here this evening. Let's, let's make this conversation even bigger. Please uh, tweet early and often this evening. My, uh, my story begins on a bus. Uh, when I was growing up, Newham, Hackney, Tower Hamlets made up one of the largest blocks of urban deprivation in Western Europe. Some of us who were at school at the time uh, raised some money. We bought an old double-decker bus and we uh, took out the seats and converted it into what we called a play bus. Really, it was just a, seat with, a bus without any seats. And then we, bought, uh, we sold, the, sold the seats, bought some uh, sports and arts materials and other, other games. And we organised a rotor bus drivers from Plasto Bus Garage, because of course we were too young to drive this thing. And they used to take it down to different sites at evenings and weekends. And we would run children's and youth activities on and around the bus. It was fabulously successful. We would get 120, 140 kids at those sessions. And so began Community Links, uh, the organisation with which I've uh, been associated ever since. I would often arrive early for those sessions and I'd walk about the estates with those children and I would hear their stories, <coughs> stories that would in turn uh, shape my life. I learned that poverty was about many things, much more than money. Often we were the only adults, me and my friends, that those children would have a grown-up conversation with. And I saw how this relational poverty links to three effects. There was an absence of cultural capital, the knowledge and uh, capabilities we acquire from mixing with others about how to behave, how to dress, how to speak in certain circumstances. An absence of networks, the people who can arrange a useful work placement, tell us about college, help us to understand a wider world and be an accessible role model. And there was an absence of belief, confidence, self-esteem. I saw that this relational poverty was every bit as aggressive and destructive as material poverty and that the two are inextricably entwined. I therefore come along this evening with a very simple conviction that we need one another. Think of the turning points in your life and what made the difference. Family, teachers, carers, friends. This is the warm web, the personal tapestries of real meaningful relationships that enable us to thrive individually and, our, and our, enable our communities to succeed. I think of the bus children and others I've worked with over the years. Repeatedly unpeeling their troubles has revealed flaws or inadequacies in that warm web. Relationships either broken or never existing to a meaningful degree. And equally invariably, the building or rebuilding of meaningful relationships has been a big part of the answer. I think of it as the you and me principle that it is not only possible for one human being to make a real and lasting difference to another, but that it is often, in the most difficult circumstance, the only thing that does. Sadly, however, I think we're moving in the wrong direction, and so do many others. Before the last mayoral election, I led a small project called Changing London, effectively a conversation with Londoners. Social connection, and the lack of it, was the top concern for our largest single group, higher than housing or health or crime, although clearly uh, not unrelated to any of these things. This reinforced my own experience. Relational poverty doesn't begin uh, 40 years ago, but it has become more widespread and acute at a time when we might have expected it to recede. We network and transact, uh, transact now more than ever, but meaningful time together has been systematically displaced by fast and shallow connections. The consequence, I think, of three tectonic shifts in the course of my working life. First, and perhaps most obviously, a shift in te technological capability. An ever bigger proportion of modern life is conducted online, the cold web. Benefits aren't collected anymore, but like rent and other payments transferred electronically. Bookings and other communications with GPs or other public sector providers seldom involve real human interaction. Shops have closed and smaller high streets in particular have changed, even disappeared, because more shopping is done online. None of these changes are additional to more personal interactions, but are in place of. 
with, of course, huge advantages for many of us, but not for those who relied on those daily routines for their day's only conversation. And invariably, those people are most likely to have been most disproportionately disadvantaged by my shift number two, the shift in ideological influences. Two years after Beveridge published his first report in 1942, Hayek was arguing in The Road to Serfdom that government planning would extinguish individualism and lead to the, the triumph of totalitarianism. Beveridge's work, of course, had an immediate impact. Hayek's was on a slower burn, but burn it has relentlessly. Fueled by a steadily growing network of academics and influencers, then policymakers and politicians. By the 1970s, the post-war Keynesian consensus was wobbling through a series of economic crises and, on, and an alternative was now oven ready. Milton Friedman's monetarism, Margaret Thatcher's property owning democracy, privatization, deregulation, the celebration of wealth, the market solution, all start here. Neoliberalism became the prevailing paradigm at Westminster and Whitehall with multiple and continuing implications for social connection. And as individualism and self-interest developed into a powerful philosophy for government, it also bled into the ways in which we think about ourselves and others, becoming the new popular common sense, as we've disconnected the consequences of our behavior as consumers from our interests as citizens. These narratives, both popular and political, have harnessed and directed the new capabilities. At the macro level, narrow, short-term competitive advantage has been chased at the expense of solid, sustainable relationships. My point here and elsewhere is not anti-business, not anti-private sector. It is anti a certain way of doing business and applies as much to head teachers and Ofsteds as it does to corporate leaders and short-term spikes in the share price. At the macro level, insecurity and inequality has displaced our capacity for meaningful connection. The fiercely infectious FOMO, fear of missing out, has driven an obsession with followership. And as we now see particularly brutally on Twitter, no responsibility to treat the community well. Division and disempowerment ensue, ultimately alienation and scapegoating. And third, and very largely as a consequence of the first two, the shift in managerial models and protocols. Our organizations have got bigger, more remote, less human. Personalization has been objective in both public and private services. But wherever we look, from job centers to shops, hospitals to banks, organizational structures and management protocols have been redesigned to customize, not to humanize, to effectively depersonalize. The local grocer, the family GP, the recognizable bank manager, all this now so last century. I stress again that there have been benefits, huge benefits for many of us, but at great cost. As we've hollowed out the heart of our businesses with call centers, our high streets with cash points and self-service checkouts, our neighborhoods with design that strips out interaction, and our public services with carers recommissioned for seven-minute visits, retendered every three months. Whether it's been the economics of globalization, the realization of opportunities presented by advances in science and technology, or the pursuit of fashions and ideologies, the consequences have been the same. We've lost the human touch, the you and me relationship. Furthermore, each separate influence has supported and been supported by the other two. So driving fundamental change in the way we live our lives and relate to one another. Now we can't rewind the clock, and I wouldn't want to, but nor should we accept what we have lost. First, I think a loss in the quality of our lives. 73% of older people in the UK now say they are lonely. 49% have been for years. And not only older people, but also teenagers, new parents, recent arrivals, Across the whole population, one in five are lonely, at least one in ten are severely isolated. Second, a loss in our collective capacity, resilience and capability. I talked earlier about the social capital that was missing for the children on the bus. 
we are four times more likely to find work through, family, through friends and neighbours as we are through the job centre. Similarly, stronger neighbourhoods have significantly less crime and they improve our chances of good health by some 27%. Indeed, a recent account even showed that better social connection in one community, in Frome in Somerset, correlated with a 17% reduction in hospital admissions at a time when they were increasing elsewhere by 29%. These are the opportunity costs, the losses we incur when our bonds are weak, and why, as the changing London commentators or contributors that I referred to earlier, were right to say that relationships are fundamental to the fulfilment of every other promise on crime or health or employment. And then my third tectonic shift, a shift in the, uh, my third loss, a shift in the, a loss in the efficacy of our agency and our services. In the Community Link's Deep Value Literature Review, we considered the role of relationships in various services. We learnt that patients who experience a good relationship with their healthcare professional are more likely to engage in positive behaviour change. That the relationship between the advisor and the client has consistently been found to be a key element in helping people into employment. And that pupils who develop positive relationships with teachers achieve better academic results. Wherever we looked, services are most effective when relationships are prioritised. We lose when they aren't sometimes perhaps in ways that we might not imagine. An examination, for instance, of healthcare malpractice lawsuits in the US found that the interpersonal aspects of the community, or, or such as communications behavior of the physicians, are often cited as central to patients' decisions to initiate malpractice litigation. This failure of relationships costs 2.4% of the US health budget. The NHS spent $1.7 billion on negligence claims last year. Better relationships certainly wouldn't eliminate all that, but they would make a dent in it. So, three sets of consequences flowing from the systemic erosion of meaningful relationships, and again they overlap. Those most disadvantaged by the loss in our collective capacity are also most dependent on effective agencies and personalised services. The sum of the parts in this relational poverty is the kind of structural inequality and broken caravan scenario with which we are already familiar on material poverty. The camels at the front of our society moving so much faster than those at the back that it eventually ceases to be one caravan, one society. Neighbourhoods, cities, nations are built from the aggregation and interweaving of countless personal relationships the worldwide warm web. When those ties fail, that which is isolating individuals ultimately leaves behind entire communities, distrustful and polarised. Fertile territory for xenophobic populism. So it is that that which made loneliness a 21st century phenomena, 21st century epidemic, has also made Donald Trump the 45th president. And I know that that's an extravagant claim, but if the foundational bonds are inadequate or dysfunctional, then so inevitably is the national discourse unstable and fractious. Trump is the flower in the buttonhole of the invisible man. If we are instead to benefit from progress in ways which don't diminish our humanity, but sustain and enrich it, we have to learn how to do things differently, to rebalance, to lose the personal touch here, but to compensate elsewhere. Focusing on loneliness would be one valid response, but it is the food bank solution, essential and insufficient. A minister of loneliness is like a minister of hunger. There's no denying the crisis, but we need to address the causes, not just the symptoms. To dig deeper, act earlier. And imagine, I suggest, a place where meaningful connections are the central operating principle, running through everything we do. A relationship-centered business, school, city, 
funding program? What would change? I think that's the defining challenge for our generation. And it was with that in mind that I came to the Marshall Institute and I heard Stefan here talk about social enterprise as the pursuit of opportunities beyond the resources you control. The pursuit of opportunities beyond the resources you control. Imagine my delight. My rather peculiar way of doing things these last 40 years is actually a thing. <laughs> Emboldened by this late epiphany, I published a series of blogs. I wanted to do it all in plain sight. So I began to discuss them. London TEDx, the open meeting of the parliamentary group, many smaller meetings. Together we began to think about the qualities of a meaningful relationship. Community Links looks for deep value. Cicely Saunders, the founder of the hospice movement, used to speak about deep time. Warm web bonds have depth. They're also unique, equal and empowering. Nourishing confidence, boosting loyalty, distributing agency, unlocking potential. We began to look together at what works and to draw out some guiding principles and imagine the, the doable changes, the practical steps that would embed such relationships everywhere. There are many of these on the blogs and I'll give you the link uh, uh, in a moment to look at, look, up, look at more. But here are just a few examples. We looked at uh, the principle that having fun together builds strong relationships. A social worker told me about two elderly women living independently. Six months ago, they both caught the flu, stopped eating, forgot their regular medication. The first one has now moved permanently into a nursing home. The second had been in an allotment group for many years. When she fell sick, other members cooked meals, ran errands, checked daily. Now she's back digging onions. Remember those numbers about the fall in a hospital admissions in Frome? Well, that's how that happens. No one in that warm web would call themselves a carer or even a volunteer. They would say, and he did say, for these are true stories, we did what anyone would do. Participation and a shared interest engages more than charity. The allotment group, the choir, the sports club, the play street, all these things enable the building of meaningful relationships. Events, street parties, socials, etc., play the same role. It's a sort of social acupuncture a localised pinprick, but with the power to catalyse a wider change. We could support much more, and not just with cash. Essex, for example, have opened 80 community buildings to community key holders. Enacting a right to space, or just doing it locally, would require all local authorities to accommodate such activity wherever there is interest and an open door. And digital connections. They should be the beginning of such real relationships. The fulfilment, not the end, and certainly not the enemy. Ask of existing applications, how might we develop it for everybody? Tinder, for example. Here, a marginally amended app with that alternative branding could also be connecting new arrivals or unsupported carers. A second principle we looked at. Some places enable relationships to thrive, some don't. Parents know that their local networks improve when their children go to school, but some improve more than others. A welcoming playground, a covered waiting area, seats all make a difference. And just as playgrounds bring us together, so too do markets, cul-de-sacs, even shared dustbins. These are the bumping places. We can either design them properly into where we live, or we can, and we often do, design them out. A common ground test added to the planning guidelines would ensure it's always in. And what about the high street? How might we rethink the fulfillment center, now a staple of the high street? What other needs might it fulfill as a regular meeting place? And finally, a third principle. We saw how organizational protocols can obstruct relationships or they can help them to flourish. If I want my holiday jabs in a busy working day, I'll be happy with a seven o'clock appointment and a clinician I don't know. If I need regular treatment for a chronic condition that keeps me housebound and alone for days, I'll want a doctor I trust and time for a conversation. 
GP caseloads could be segmented, paying doctors more for patients who need more time. And social care might be better delivered by small local teams, loosely modelled on the Bertseg model, and trained and trusted to manage themselves. More broadly, perhaps, services might never be commissioned without demonstrating how they will enable relationships to flourish for those that need them. And one more thing on the high street, segmentation even works here. Sainsbury's are now trialling quick shopping sessions, optimising speed for the busy buyer, and slow sessions for those who shop for companionship. And whilst we're talking about supermarkets, uh, couldn't they all reimagine their cafes? The typical afternoon customer, go there on a Wednesday afternoon, the typical afternoon customer, one per table. Surely they're telling us something. All these are, are doable possibilities. And many, many more on the blogs. How do we make them commonplace? Well, I want to conclude with uh, uh, three sets of proposals. First, a practical tool. We've seen that most things, hospitals, banks, supermarkets, funding programs, classrooms, job centers, neighborhoods, councils, governments, don't work well when relationships are undervalued. Or at the very least, they don't work as well as they could. They have been planned for a, sm for a smooth process, not designed for the best outcome. Systematic transactions are planable. Warm relationships cannot be so easily reduced to recurring algorithms. We can only unleash the potential here by designing or redesigning from a different relationship-centered perspective. And with good support, doing it for ourselves. Barefoot design. Go with the people, live with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build with what they have, wrote Lao Tzu, with the best leaders when the work is done, People will say we've done this for ourselves. We're planning a community of practice which jointly builds, applies, and shares a new framework for relationship-centered design. It will consist of a set of design principles which draw on other disciplines in an approach that can be widely understood and adopted. The principles will be translated into practice <laughs> with instruments for diagnosis on co-design and management and measurement. And around these online tools, there will be expert support and matchmaking. Nick Stanhope and the award-winning SHIFT team have been pioneering service design in the social sector and will lead the work. Ray Shostak, former head of the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit, will lead on test and learn. Second, something different. Alongside the framework, we need a different intervention to involve others beyond the immediately sympathetic and to, quote, Po quote Pope Francis, to foster a new culture of encounter. Tim Schmidt, founder of The Big, Big Lunch, says people need an excuse to connect. The lunch provided it with enduring impact. 82% stay in touch. 74% feel a stronger sense of community. Half now do things together that they had never done before. There's dead wood here. Some people would have known others already. Some people will not sustain the relationships. But 9.3 million people participated last year. This simple and blunt intervention is remarkably effective at growing the warm web. Big Lunch was never marketed as a worthy thing to do, but rather as fun, alternative, <coughs> meet someone you fancy, a little local adventure. Stratford, Hull, even Edinburgh have had much bigger adventures of their own with the Olympics, the City of Culture, and the annual festival. Whether it's garage sale trails, dragon parades, or Easter races, people behave differently, most visibly for a short time, but like the big lunch with an enduring legacy if certain magic ingredients are present. Suppose we think about such adventures everywhere, guided by just two rules, that they are created by the local people and that they bring us together. To make that happen at scale, we might look for inspiration in a different field. Airbnb has never turned a single sheet, but are offering more beds tonight than the entire world's stock of hotels because they exploit an untapped resource with a lightweight engine. If modern lives are crowding out the natural instinct to connect with one another, it doesn't disappear. Like those empty houses, it lies dormant. 
We too need something different to reach the unreached, a disruptor that would encourage such creativity everywhere, but without owning the means. Perhaps as much as a minister for loneliness, we need a minister for great adventures. Can you see that happening? <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> and anyway, we know that uh, real innovation rarely starts in government. So suppose instead we make an independent ministry for great adventures to promote events and activities which stimulate the building of enduring relationships. The ministry would offer brokerage with improbable friends, perhaps a managed fund, some regional, maybe mayoral challenges, bespoke schemes for business and practical support for whole community adventures and for small ones focused on a single street or school. It would be eye-catching, quirky, surprising. We would track and evaluate. What are those magic ingredients which turn a local moment into a movement, bringing us together in ways that last? We'd learn fast and with smart, adaptive management grow more. Some experienced adventurers, Hilary Cottam, Tim Schmidt, Steve Weiler, Gail Greengross, are helping to take this idea forward. And my third proposal. Alvin Toffler said that you've got to think about big things while doing small things, so all the small things go in the right direction. That's what makes apparently simple ideas transformative. If it's the narrative of recent decades, uh, if it is the narrative of recent decades that has harnessed and directed our new capabilities, then we need also to develop our own account of a relationship-centred democracy and spread this different principle. In 2018, we don't need to wait for seminal texts or even to gather in a Swiss village to start a global conversation. This is where the technology really comes into its own. Hive minds can spread the word and spawn the practice with an open book. A simple collaborative platform for what others are saying, writing and doing. The object? Absolutely not a coalition of organisations. Diversity is strength. But a coalescence of ideas and a shared commitment to a relationship-centred democracy. We're planning a seminar co-led with Michael Little at the Institute on April 25th to help plot the next steps on this one. Now, of course, a tool for redesigning what we do, a sparky disruptor for tapping fresh potential, and a programme for spreading the word is not a linear process. Supporting good design enables more to do it better. Involving others generates further learning and fuels the rolling narrative. This, in turn, informs better design, so on and so on. Momentum is acquired over time with a beating heart of its own. And this takes me to my final reflection. I think of the bootstrap operations I've been involved with over the years, cobbling together policies, even party manifestos, the pea shooter budgets of think tanks and campaigns now fabulous aspirations. And I think back to Hayek and all that ensued. I'm no fan of the doctrines, but I am full of admiration for the painstaking realism and the dogged commitment to build and deliver. That, my friends, is how you change the world. Popular and enduring movements cannot be imposed, but we can open up the possibility with patient, shared, egoless action on the ground and the sustained collaborative development of an honest, evolving narrative. Even the moment's right. A time of uncertainty is also a time of opportunity. So, because everything starts with intentions, we help to build relationships into the everyday with an open framework for relationship-centred design. Because we want to grow the warm web, we cultivate the unexpected with the Ministry of Great Adventures. And because real change is a long game, we find new ways to spread the word over and over again. And because, of course, none of this will amount to anything if it isn't collaborative, I'd love you to respond. Do tell me what interests you, and at the very least, sign up to stay in touch. 
T.S. Eliot wrote about not ceasing from our explorations until we arrive at where we started and know it for the first time. I started with those children on the bus. Mostly, as I get older, I am less sure of pretty much everything. But of this, I am certain. Strong relationships are not an alternative to a thriving school or an effective health service, a flourishing business, or a successful society. They are the making of it all. One of my proposals this evening is adventurous, like the bus, targeting the unengaged. One deep in the day-to-day -day changes delivery. The third embeds momentum. But if you're looking for the architecture that binds it all together, don't. There is none. Too often in the third sector, we want to capture an issue and build an empire. We occupy when we should liberate. I'm interested in sustained and collective impact, in planting trees in whose shade we may never sit. These ideas would exploit the potential beyond the resources we control, help to nourish and unleash the power of human beings being human and yet be of a character that in years to come, people will say, we did this for ourselves, you and me. Thank you. I think I just heard Trump described as the flower in the buttonhole of the invisible man. Um, and if I did, congratulations on phrase making, if not for encouraging us to liberate rather than capture. Um, it's my very great pleasure now to introduce uh, two distinguished commentators uh, on David's talk. Uh, and first on my right, I'm Hilary Cotton. Many of you will know Hilary's work, innovator, social entrepreneur, pioneer of precisely some of the design approaches that David has just been talking about, um, and the author of uh, Radical Help, um, which is in all good bookstores near you from June, um, and is about how to live, care, learn, and love. Hilary. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And thank you to David for a brilliant, I mean, a brilliant speech. And I can also really recommend for those of you who haven't read David's blogs to also read the blogs, which are just as amazingly written and kind of go into the issues in more depth. And like David, I come to these issues through practice, through community work in this country, but also for decades in Africa and Latin America. And so it's probably no coincidence that my methods of working are very similar to David's, moving into the barrio, renting a house on an estate where other people perhaps now fear to live, or actually we also rented buses and filling them up with pizza on a Friday night to go and seek conversations. Um, because that's what I look for. I look for spaces where I can just listen without an agenda, where we don't have to ask, can we fix this or that service, but where we can really understand what's going on in people's lives. And as some of you know, over the last 10 years, I ran a social enterprise and worked with communities across Britain, building exemplars of a new form of the welfare state. And we tackled issues like ageing, loneliness, adolescence, chronic disease, the challenges of modern work. And at the heart of all the solutions which were grown sort of top down and bottom up was relationships. Because if you want to age well, you need good company. And as David says, it needs to be real company. It can't be some condescending, befriending service. It has to be the opportunity to meet people who are like you, who share your interests, people that you really want to be with. Um, if you want to find good work, again, as David said, it's really important. And actually, even more importantly, as recent research from the Resolution Foundation has shown, if you want to progress in work, then it's your relationships uh, that matter, and so therefore for some people this is becoming impossibly hard to do. 
We know that relationships matter. And yet, as the important work of Mike Savage and his colleagues here at the LSE has shown, we don't know each other anymore. So our networks are tightening as there is a growth of inequality in wealth. We live in different places. We know different people. Increasingly, we go to different schools. And so Mike Savage uh, can predict who you know based on, he might even be in this room actually, I don't know what Professor Savage looks like, so I don't know if you're actually here, but he's not here. But he can predict um, who you know basically based on your income. And he shows in his research how class and income overrides everything else, including the benefits of education. So the lack of these everyday relationships that David is talking about is becoming dominant in determining what happens to us. And I think what's worse is that existing public services often exacerbate this problem. So there's the culture of the market, consumers, service delivery of transaction that David's talked about. Um, but there's also a culture of risk, which I think is another very important element in this, which means that our services are not actually neutral. In fact, what they often do to manage risk is they erode those bonds that actually would otherwise exist between us. So we see this, for instance, startlingly in uh, services for young people, those that still remain where academic shows that what young people need to, th to thrive is this network of very broad and different relationships. And yet what we have, we fund you know, youth-only spaces, schools, after-school clubs, youth clubs, if that doesn't work, the Young Offenders Institution. So we're actually designing, still, we're actually designing relationships out. Um, and I think there's one other thing that I want to add to what David said that I think is very important, which is that there's a lack of relationships within <coughs> services, and it's very hard to work in any institution that privileges a transactional culture over relationships with your, with your peers, with fellow workers. These places no longer feel human. So one of the reasons I love the film I, Daniel Blake is that you see in that film the job centre worker try to help Daniel, but actually she's not allowed to, that she will lose her job if she goes out there. And I think many of this experience this, which is that people help us, but they help us in spite of the institutions. So stress and the resulting time taken off costs um, the NHS actually more than, than legal cases. It costs 2.4 billion a year. And so we get these announcements of more doctors, more nurses, but we're sort of trying to fill this bottomless bucket because we're not attending to relationships within these organisations. So David has asked in his blogs what we can do to join the dots. And I just want to very briefly kind of build on what David said and, and sort of emphasise three things. So first, as Stefan said, I'm a designer. And I think that actually this doesn't actually start with tools. It starts with the vision, the brief of where we want to be, how we want to live, and where we're trying to go. And then it does inform, as David said, every single question, does this park bench enable older people to inhabit public space? Does the design of this housing state actually kind of foster bonds or rip up bonds that were already there? Does this health intervention help us to motivate ourselves by stitching our relationships together? And technology is another important opportunity because it can open up, it can allow more and more of us to participate in low cost and we can use this infrastructure in new ways and include people and say service lasts, but how do we include people in these solutions? Secondly, the metrics. I think that we're not working on these uh, important issues because we literally can't see them. We're using tools, measurements, technologies that are based in the 1950s and are not prioritising these things and if we can't see them, we can't measure them, we can't work on them. And then thirdly, funders, philanthropists, foundations, the state need to support what's already growing. There's a growing body of evidence that shows that work related, rooted in relationships works. But this work is messy, it goes forwards as well as backwards. Um, and sometimes um, it's very difficult, I think, for funders to kind of actually sort of have the courage of their convictions to invest in this work. There's a lot of investment in small pilots, but now we need to grow this in new ways and really stitch those together. So like David, I don't have any nostalgia for the past. Um, you know, in the past, I would have been the wife, the mother that Beveridge thought would do all the caring. Um, so I don't want to go back to those kinds of um, paths and where we think there were very strong relationships. I want to move forward. I think there were really important reasons why relationships were at one time designed out to kind of confront challenges of race, gender, equality. But it's not working anymore. We need a different way forward. And so what I see all around me is already kind of a huge desire to participate, kind of increased education, increased empathy skills, but this difficulty of linking into um, institutions. 
And so um, I do argue, actually, in my forthcoming book, Radical Help, that all of this is much closer than we think. We can see it all around us. But the challenge really is how to join that good practice together, how to invest in it, and how to grow it so it moves from the margin to the centre. And I think that that is all about practice. So I also, you know, really am excited to be a great adventurer and to discuss with all of you here this evening the kind of very practical things which David is suggesting, because that is definitely the way forward, doing exercising that relational muscle and then moving forward together. So thank you very much, David. Thank you. Hey, now it's my enormous pleasure to introduce um, John Cruddus, MP for Dagenham and, and Raynham, and someone who uh, endeared himself to me when I was doing a bit of reading and research for this evening. I discovered a speech that John had made um, in three years ago, three, four years ago, uh, the title of which was Love and Work, These Things Only. And uh, that uh, made me realize what a perfect choice he was to respond to David's talk tonight. John. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That's a quote from William Morris. I, I think was going to say. ask, was yeah, it William it's, Morris? It was. Um, well, look, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I thought that was a, an incredibly stimulating uh, talk from David. And, I, and my first take on it was I hadn't heard such a, a fantastic call for a renewed sense of fraternity for a very long time, you know. And I, I thought the way it counterposed it with the Hayek sort of freedoms models and indeed the sort of utilitarianism of some of the arguments around material justice to reset the conversation was a really, really inspiring way through it, which is not surprising given that many of us know David through many years. and. Um, He's an inspiring figure and a great pioneer in terms of modern social policy. And indeed, someone who's as comfortable in Canning Town or Dagenham talking about the day-to-day -day issues around this as he is in Whitehall or Westminster or the Town Hall or the, um, uh, the, the sites of government power wherever they may be, or City Hall for that reason. Um, so it's no surprise that it's such a compelling story. I, I just wanted to make a few points about it. Um, the first one I, I, I'd emphasise is the context within which this is happening. And I, I would say this is an MP, but I've never known such a, a coarsening public conversation and a deteriorating sense at the local level. I'll give you some practical examples. We have our caseworks doubled in four or five years. We have eight, 900 cases a week. Whereas a few years ago, even say 10 years ago, you'd have a, a case that had an isolated element, be they education or welfare reform issue. Now the way there is such a compound nature to every case you have, be it housing or welfare or some addiction issues or uh, multiple issues around the benefit system, um, often with a mental health issue, means that the sheer volume of casework is, in terms of the headcount, more and more, but in terms of the qualitative side, more and more complex and difficult. And at the same time, the platform in terms of resource allocation, it's like the walls are coming in and the ceiling's coming down all the time which chokes off innovation. I hear a lot of arguments around, you know, burning platforms can be the source of inspiring innovation thinking, but I think we should always remember the context within which people are living their lives is um, euphemistically described as challenging usually by politicians, which means often it's decaying and really, really difficult. And um, the third problem is, I think, the which David alluded to, which I wanted to make a couple of points about, was the widening public conversation he talked about where Brexit is literally creating a sense of stasis in the country in terms of public policy reform or innovation or support or creativity or even trying to incubate new ideas. The decks are literally being cleared um, whilst the country has a sense of being on tilt in terms of the social policy challenges it, it, it has before us. And meanwhile, there's less of access to rights or support at local level because of certain reforms that have taken place uh, and a sense of a lack of agency and support at local level. So the public conversation is deteriorating. In real terms, the material challenges are rising exponentially. Um, and I think we have to continuously have an eye on the context within which any of this conversation takes place. Having said all that, Obviously, this is tough stuff, but the evidence base you talk to in terms of what we know, what works, the preventative stuff, the reconfiguring services around families and their needs, the cross-departmental work, that site of innovation and the evidence base which is growing comparatively, as well as in this country, is a source of 
you know, is a key reference point and uh, resource that we need to work and work across consistently. But I thought, uh, maybe I was wrong, but what I took away from the, the talk was something deeper, actually, which was a search for a new public philosophy. It's very bold in terms of the challenge to public policymakers or, dare I say it, those who in, inhabit the academy or politicians um, or everyday practitioners, think tank people is. Actually, the call to arms was really one of a new public philosophy of the common good. Um, now, this sounds somewhat old-fashioned, but I could never think of a more appropriate time in terms of what we need. The argument that social democracy is going through a uh, uh, possibly a terminal period in terms of uh, that energy and vitality and creativity that came through that post-war period. Um, you talk about Hayek, Thatcher, Reagan pushing back against it, that crisis of the late 70s, the ameliorative arguments of the third way, near Mitter or whatever, and um, post-crash, that sense of growth-based social democracy has sort of hit a wall. What comes after? Was it a social democracy captured by growth and a form of statecraft that was remote, technocratic, managerial, that does not have the answers when you need a revitalized sense of uh, moral or ethical underpinnings of a reimagined social democracy. And that's what I took out of the talk, actually. And that is a hugely ambitious project, but actually is commensurate with the challenge of our times, actually. Um, and I think it's great that you're beginning to chart that out on such a big canvas. I would simply say it does go with the grain of some things that are beginning to percolate. I would, for example, my own constituency, we have a project called Participatory City, which is a massive project to try and rebuild hundreds of forms of uh, community projects, uh, new forms of social capital, which I think, I don't know, David's very aware of, and I would um, welcome people getting more and more involved in that sort of project, because it could be a sort of laboratory to test drive some of these ideas you're working on. Um, similarly, we're just launching a new platform in the Labour Party called Labour Together, an emphasis on the fraternity of the word together um, and counterposed to some of the factionalism that sometimes presents itself in the public domain, an argument around new forms of social policy, um, economic reform, as well as democratic and constitutional reform in a non-factionalized way and a sense of plural discussion about the opportunities that lie ahead against the backdrop of what I think you were asking for, which is a, a bigger picture sense of what is a renewed public philosophy for the center left. That's what I took specifically from your project. Um, and that is the great task, I think, that confronts politicians on my side of the uh, canvas, because you're increasingly be seeing more and more economism. You're seeing more determinism in thinking, whether of technological determinism, or be that around very traditional uh, left philosophies, um, which crowd out social policy, which is seen as a second order thing which actually sees ethics and humanism as a bit second order as well, to be perfectly blunt with you. And I think, finally, the point I would say is what I thought you were asking, requesting, David, was a new humanism in the public domain, actually. And I don't mean the humanism, say, Richard Dawkins. I mean a deeper sense of fraternity, duty, and obligation to one another that should characterize our public conversation. And that is the real task, I think, that politics, confronts philosophy, confronts public policy making more generally, how we all live together and how we can wrap that round a theory of how social, how society can be reordered again. And that basically means a theory of justice based on humanist credentials. Um, and I applaud you for putting that, laying that down on the table because that I think is the key job that needs to be confronted in terms of politics, philosophy, and public policy making of our time, and the clock is ticking. Things are deteriorating in real time. And um, I urge you to do more and more, because um, there's no greater task, actually, that confronts us as a society, because my sense is we are deteriorating in real time. And if we don't do this quickly, we could be moving towards a very perilous state of affairs. So I applaud your work, David. Um, all power to your elbow, and I look forward to working with you over the months and years ahead.
Okay. Um, we're going to move now into the section of the evening in which uh, we ask questions of David and the two commentators. And in a minute, I'm going to open those questions to the floor. So start thinking now about honing the perfect question. Um, when it comes to your turn to ask the perfect question, tell us who you are, uh, wait for the microphone to arrive, um, and frame your question as a question. Um, I'm going to start, um, it's my job usually in, in these, on these evenings, um, to think of something obvious to disagree with, with the prevailing consensus on the panel. Um, and I'm struggling a little bit tonight because I'm so much in sympathy with so much of what's been said. Um, but let me try to channel my inner Steve Pinker and say <laughs> there are some senses in which things are getting better, not worse. There are some senses in which people are more connected. There are some instances in identity politics um, or, or, or other in specific identities in which people are closer together now than they have, have been in the history of humankind. Um, and um, um, Pinker would say but surely we are, as it were, um, in this kind of meliorizing, kind of whiggish sense, you know, uh, in a better place than we were, and some of the things you describe are, are just the kind of lumpiness of progress. Yes, but we can do better than that. Um, I, I, th I think the lumpiness of progress is, 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 is an interesting way of putting it. I, I think whenever there has been, you know, throughout history, whenever there have been technological advance from, you know, agrarian revolution and closure, you know, or everything through the industrial revolution and thereafter, you see uh, social change lagging behind and then catching up a little bit later as we learn how to behave with the, our new capabilities. And I think we are very much in that catch up phase. My concern would be like John's, that I don't think we're doing very well in catching up. We're catching up very slowly, if at all. But I, I would agree that we are lagging behind. I think that I, I have no doubt in my mind that pretty much everything I talked about, uh, you could also say, has, has had a positive effect on some people. Um, I think about, you know, I talked about health care being regionalized, for instance. I have an elderly friend who was, uh, went to the local hospital for uh, 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 very regularly around her condition. She now goes to a regional unit, a regional stroke unit, where the health care is considerably more expert than she was accustomed to be receiving locally. But she laments the fact that she doesn't know anybody there. Now, it doesn't seem to me to be beyond the wit of humankind for us to be able to reconcile those two ideas and be able to build into the regional unit the relationships that we've lost by moving it out of the local. And so I absolutely, I wouldn't want to go back to a time when we didn't have that sort of expert health care, but we need to find a way of delivering it that restores relationships. But <clears throat> Christopher Hitchens would say declinists are uh, cause part of the problem by piling on the, uh, the negative analysis. Do you not worry that that's a risk in this movement that you're, that you're proposing? I, I, well, I think we've got to be realistic. And I, and I think that, uh, uh, I, I think on a number of issues that uh, I had something to do with over my lifetime as a community worker, I think there is a lack of understanding in the wider world about some of the issues that uh, some members of our society are dealing with. And I think uh, uh, taking the opportunity to raise some of those from time to time is a, is a responsible thing to do. Well, yes, I mean, what I want to say is that I was lucky enough to have a tea with Stephen Pinker. Was he here the week ago or week before last? And what he said to me was, so this is, you know, he, how would this actually work in those areas in the US where there is no work to be found? Like, in fact, because I think his analysis is, yes, that if the trends are going well, there's still pockets, as David's talking about, there are still communities that really need this, um, a different approach, that kind of existing approaches simply don't work. Um, and what I would say to your kind of original question about things getting better is that I, in some senses, I agree. I mean, I actually think the reason that... Uh, David's work and his writing has hit a nerve is because there are so many of us out there that are now working in this way and that there is a kind of whole younger generation whose instinct is to kind of join in, tinker, make things, mend things. And so we kind of at the same time as we've got different kinds of problems that need different solutions, we have got a kind of desire for mass participation. The problem is we've also got these 1950s institutions that you simply can't get into. You can't access the resource. And we have professionals that have to spend a lot of time gatekeeping, keeping people out. So it's about kind of turning that on its head. 
Well, I thought David was very nuanced on that point in his speech, and much more than I would be, actually. Uh, because <laughs> I, I would, well, I would say, I don't know, in my constituency, um, there is a, a, a palpable sense of festering rage about people's inability to live the life they wish to, nor the lives they were promised by successive uh, generations of politicians, and uh, an inability to answer or come up with an alternative um, to their sense of um, both betrayal and uh, resentment that goes with that. Um, now, that's not to discount in any way uh, an appreciation of technological advances or um, ways of uh, you know, people living longer, etc. But the, if you want, the, the tempo of the conversation is, I think, in a very dangerous place. And I think we see it being reflected in some of the recent, uh, the centre emptying out, you know, some of the, the edges of the political conversation being emboldened. But I don't think that's the thin end of a very big wedge, I'm afraid. Um, so I don't buy into the, the counter argument that, oh no, objectively things are improving and if only people were clever enough to realise their, uh, their, you know, the lives that they should be appreciating more, then uh, I, I'm at the other end of the uh, spectrum, I'm afraid. And I think this is this is uh, this is growing. And uh, I don't see uh, to tell you the truth, I don't see any real countervailing movement to to try and resolve these this crisis that is developing. That's why I was so appreciative of what David was saying, actually, because I thought it was a very thoughtful route into these complex problems that we are uh, singularly unable to even talk about rather than remedy. So here, so, there you go. <laughs> so here endeth my uh, impersonation of Steve Pinker, the hair colour notwithstanding. Um, and I'm going to now ask you to ask us questions. Tell us who you are. Tell us if you have a particular person you wish to direct the question to. And please wait for the microphone to arrive. And if you put your hand up while someone's asking a question, I will try to cue things up so that uh, we can move quickly. So there are two people right in the middle. The first one on just there. And then immediately after you, you can hand it back to the person behind you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Richard Harris. I work for the charity Path Change Trust. We support community-run businesses and cooperatives. We're investing about £7 million into community-level research, and I was just thinking about what Hillary was saying about the importance of research. So it's really a question for her and, and for David, David in particular. What's the one piece of work we could commission that would best help demonstrate and test some of the ideas you've been talking about on the you and me principle? Okay, David first, then Hillary. One piece, and that's challenging. Um, I, I, I think I talked a little bit about social acupuncture. And you know, we know that certain kinds of activities, I talked about big lunch, but we know certain kinds of events, certain kinds of, of group activities uh, lead to the sort of building of relationships. I talked about the allotment for some people and some don't. Some are just a street party and uh, you know, they're all over in the afternoon. What is it that turns a, mo a moment into a movement in some places and not in others? What is it that turns uh, group activities beyond the allotment or the table tennis into something broader than that. And I think it is more than just the personalities that are involved. I think there is more that we can tease out from that and we can learn from that and we can find ways of re reproducing, spawning is the word I used earlier, in other places. I don't think you can replicate it. I think our sector has got, a bit in it, particularly in its relationships with government, has got into a, a relationship where too often we give the impression that we can take a model and just kind of plonk it down in another place and industrialize it. I don't think we can do that, but I think we can tease out from, from what works in all this some lessons that will be more broadly applicable. And that is one of the things I would like to see done. Well, I think it's a really big question because I think we need different measures because we're measuring things that belong in the old system. So we're kind of trying to move forward whilst we keep 
turning back and also you know all our systems everybody who works in those systems is trying to move forward but is being assessed on uh, old things I think that you know in, in the work that we did we kind of developed capability measures to kind of move forward in the system but I think a lot more work needs to be done not just on what we should research but how we can research it so that it can keep moving forward and not become the kind of checklist that has happened before so I think it's what we're going to measure as well as how we're going to do it in very different ways and the other thing that I think is really important is time because actually, I mean, I don't know if you know the work of Valent at Harvard, the kind of chair of psychiatry. I mean, his, he does some of the very rare, properly longitudinal research. And what his research shows over time is that the only thing that matters really is religion and relationships. Um, but we, we, we don't know because we kind of look at things for two years and then we move on to the next project. And David in his talk referred to time. And I think this is a huge theme which also impacts on measurement. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is James Plunkett uh, from the Social Investment Group. I think, Hilary, your point about time, it kind of links into what I'd like to say. And that is that um, Julian Abel, who set up the project in Froome through the Compassionate Communities um, UK organization, it took him four years to get to where he is. So that issue of time is absolutely essential. And the thought that I had is that we constantly battle commissioners with a one-year budget cycle or a four-year political cycle. And anybody's favorite topic this year is going to be somebody else's favorite topic, or it'll be another favorite topic. And I think that the question that we need to be asking the politicians and the commissioners is how they come together and build their own relationships and how they work holistically <coughs> and pool their budgets and get a way that creates the relationship within that whole top layer, not just in the community relationships, but the relationships of the people who get this work funded. And I, I suppose my question then is how we, how we encourage that political strata to work more relationally together to enable the communities to come together and to be funded. John. Um, my experience, um, and this one is that over the last few years, unfortunately, it's partly the, the cross-departmental initiatives that would nurture precisely those sorts of that, that work are some of the first to go in terms of the process of retrenchment within back into silos and departments. Um, so it makes it more difficult, even though the evidence base is growing about what what needs to be done in terms of getting out of that silo base, and especially the evidence at a very local level in terms of where the enduring interventions are securing real outcomes is based around pooled budgeting, you know, strong emphasis on early interventions, all of that, uh, the devolution of services, um, and uh, partnerships of organizations working outside of their traditional rooms. Now, that seems to me to be pretty unarguable across the front is creating and retaining the political will to grip that in terms of longer term budget setting, partly out outside of the cycle of um, elections, wherever they might be, or referenda, or, you know, um, and there's, there's that sense that that's being concertinaed as well at the present time, which means that that scope to lock in that, that enduring sort of partnership and pool budgeting is is I think about especially with David Cameron um, tried to be very creative around that for a, for a few years and it looked to me like we were making real progress as as was the Labour Party around a lot of that in the context of some of the policy change and policy work that was going on which was getting away from the simple traditions of uh, resource allocation and much more fertile creative space that was being created across parties by the way as well um, and I think the last three or four years have seen that drain away a bit for obvious reasons in terms of the electoral arithmetic, that sense of, um, well, the prime minister disappearing, you know, some of the culture that went along with that has emptied out the possibilities of that, I'm afraid. Okay. But it's something that has to be returned to because it's self-evidently the space that needs to be inhabited. Uh, thank you. My name's Pippa Not, and I work at the Centre for Youth Impact. Um, so we think particularly about how to um, understand and improve how we understand impact and work with young people. Um, I'm interested about, um, so you're talking here about two things, about relationships between peers and within communities and also relationships between sort of service providers and service beneficiaries using crude language. 
Um, in either way, uh, in either case, we're talking about progress through social progress, social change through relationships, which requires a lot of trust from government funders, commissioners in frontline people delivering the, re the relationships and in the people kind of involved in those relationships. Um, so, uh, David, you mentioned the Smerden report on um, that kind of finds quite clearly that services are improved when relationships are at the heart of those services. But is that message strong enough in any of your opinions um, to really get senior civil servants, managers of services and politicians putting trust in frontline workers and in those people receiving the services to deliver the outcomes that, that they want? And are those even the same outcomes, the outcomes that individuals want and the outcomes that, okay. that government wants? Uh, Pippa, I, I, you used the word trust. I'm not sure that I did use it, and if I didn't, I should have done, because I think it's absolutely fundamental to, uh, to what we're talking about. Um, are, are the levels sufficiently high? No, I, I don't think they are. I think one of the issues is because we do everything on such a huge scale, and uh, um, I think trust would be much higher if we looked at ways in which we can uh, deliver services in much smaller units, and that's why I, I touched on very briefly the, the Birdsell model on, of delivery of social care. I think that applies uh, in, in other areas as well. I think it, it, your question also relates in a sense to the last one, when, uh, the question about uh, uh, the, the, the length of time over which we are prepared to uh, uh, develop and deliver services. I think that uh, that again is about trust, that we are expecting results far too quickly. But I think that it, there is a responsibility on those of us who uh, uh, believe in the kinds of things that uh, we've been talking about this evening, a, a responsibility to say we're not saying that, that, what we, that a relationship is more important than delivering an efficient and an effective health service or an efficient and effective school. What we are saying is that this is the way in which you can deliver an efficient and effective school. So there is a responsibility on us absolutely to, to do, as, as, as Hillary has said, to be able to measure that. Uh, but I think we are very close to being able to do that and in some places that is done. So trust is really, really important. It's essential to all this. But we're not saying, just trust us and it'll turn out all right. We are also saying we have evidence to show this stuff works. Okay. Hi, um, Kate Cooley from Social Finance. Um, you've part answered this question just now, but it sort of builds on the past two. Um, I'm interested, you mentioned beverage in your, speak, in your um, presentation. How, what are your thoughts on, on the role of the welfare state? Um, and, and while you've just said that none of the stuff that you're suggesting replaces well-delivered services, it's a model for how we deliver those services. There is a pushback on the kind of projects that social finance and lots of others in the room um, deliver in terms of are you taking over the role of, of government and are we, you know, there's, a, there's an odd tension between um, organisations and social enterprises and the role that government are promising that they're delivering for vulnerable people. First Hillary, then David. Yeah, so I want to say that I, I don't, I probably have a slightly more nuanced view. I mean, I, I personally think that the, the welfare state needs to be completely rethought. I think it's a 1950s institution that can't grapple with 21st century problems. And I think that relationships are really important because they're about power. You know, and this goes back to the previous question, which is that if you've got a relationship with somebody, there's an equality there. And that is a fundamental shift in most of the relationships we see in any of our services today, which are really all about doing something to somebody. However nicely that is wrapped up in beautiful language and we talk about personal this and that, basically it's about power and we need to invert that power and that's why I'm interested in relationships because I think that automatically happens. You can't do a relationship to somebody. You have to kind of get in there together and I mean that is a huge challenge to our uh, current welfare model. Um, I don't see that as whether it should be the private sector or the kind of social enterprise sector or anything else. I think it's, it's much deeper than that but I think that would be a kind of evening seminar in and of itself, but it goes to the nub of the problem, really, and the, the possibility. Okay, right at the back. Um, hi, my name is Simon Radford. Um, I guess sociologists talk a lot about bonding capital and bridging capital. We've talked a lot about the relationship between mainly working class communities and the state. In terms of bridging capital in a world where lots of people think working class communities must be racist because they voted for Brexit, or um, think that, you know, sort of gentrification, or label them as chavs, what's a way to getting people who have huge amounts of power and resources 
um, to engage with working class communities in a way that they don't tend to interact with them via the state. There's been a decline in the religious ethic, which used to be a motivation. Uh, they used to serve them alongside them in trenches, but no longer do because um, they don't really sign up for wars anymore. What's a way to engage the rich and the powerful and the people who have means and resources to actually engage with working class, see them as humans, and try and perhaps enter into networks with them rather than bridging between them, bonding between themselves? John? Uh, <laughs> well, well, what's your thinking? Well, I mean, my, my constituency voted 70% to leave the European Union. Um, and if there's a vote tomorrow, I think a fair few of them would do so again. Um, I don't like a lot of the tempo of the conversation, which, you know, the, the open versus closed models, whereas in some sense the community are represented is closed. I think it's slightly more complicated than that. The left behind notion, I think I don't like that either, because it, it sort of puts these communities in a box, whereas they're much more uh, alive in terms of the cross currents within them. Actually, the mixed views within people which they can hold, which don't mean you're in this zero-sum game of you're either left behind or you're somehow some sort of urban networked youth, you know what I mean? There's, there's this the binary poly, uh, conversation that's being developed, which actually just reinforces the sense of a canyon down the country, you know what I mean? And you're either one side or the other, which is played out in the uh, diagnosis of the statistics at the uh, election. I'll give you a counter-argument. We, um, a few years ago, which David was involved in, actually, we, we set up, anticipating some welfare reform changes and escalating housing problems, we set up a project called a Good Society Project in Dagenham, right, to try and rebuild a sense of uh, volunteering and participation at local level. And the idea was literally a very old model where we wanted to get volunteers um, to keep an eye out for neighbours, um, you know, get sort of try and rewire the community and we got thousands and thousands of people opt in, self-consciously opt in to this sense of searching to rewire and rebuild that sense of social capital, a desire to rebuild a sense of uh, uh, fraternity or neighbourliness to combat isolation and it really hit a nerve. If you can create ways of trying to build these initiatives, it's latent there, that desire to live that life and build that good society is there and what you need to do is codify it into policy programs public conversations a, a renewed public philosophy because i think it lies deep within the human condition i mean it is premised on a notion of human nature which uh, contemporary thinking might challenge in terms of transhumanism seems to be inf having a growing influence in public policy making so it is a it is a return to this humanist concerns that david identified and I think it very much goes with the grain with these caricatured people of bit racist, left behind, working class, closed, blah, blah, blah. Um, I come from that community, you know what I mean? They are my family and friends and neighbours are talking about, and it's a belittling demonisation that's occurring, um, which reinforces the coarsening conversation and that sense of uh, rage and dispossession that's going on. And unless we push back about that, then you're just talking gated communities. They're just higher gates, bigger walls. There's a question right at the top, up there. Um, hi, uh, my name's Duncan Chopsall from Lloyds Bank Foundation of England and Wales. We're an independent charitable trust and we fund small and local charities because we think the local and the smallness matters. And we're also funding a project called Home Share, which is about tackling loneliness between the generations. Um, that was a hugely inspiring talk, David, as always. Um, but I'm afraid I'm slightly on the John Crudder's depressed side of um, things. <laughs> sorry I, um, not that you're depressed, sorry, John, but the, the <laughs> highlighting the, the, the huge cuts at the local level, the move to commissioning everything at scale, the move to um, <coughs> in the public sector. But the, massive, the size of that cut is huge, and I don't think we fully appreciate that often. But I, I wanted to actually reflect a bit on the private sector and the challenges of economics there, where increasingly we know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. On the, on the positive side, but then the challenge, the positive side was, I don't know if you saw on Twitter the story of the guy who tweeted about Sainsbury's, who'd created a job for his mother who had Alzheimer's. Um, and they created this role, so she came into work and they lovingly really cared for this woman for, throughout many years. But the challenge is you see our high streets are dying. In poor areas, they're dying because people don't have money. And in richer areas, they're dying because we want to go online. And we used to worry that people just live to shop. Now they don't even go out to the high street to meet people. Younger people can't even get jobs in shops because the shops aren't there. So it's that challenge about 
where do we what are the high streets how are we going to tackle that big drive in the economic sphere not just the public sector the economic sphere that we put relationships back in because it can cost more thank you david um, well, I, I'm a community worker by trade, and I think a community worker without optimism is like a, like a writer without words, a plumber without tools. You know, it doesn't really work. And so I, I, I am essentially optimistic. Um, but as, as I said earlier, I do think we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, and I think the high street is one of those places where we need to do that catching up. I, I think we've got to think about how, um, as we do shop more and more online, uh, how we think about shops as, a, as a, a relational experience, a social experience. Apparently, Waitrose in some of their stores now, you don't buy stuff there, you, you sample it. You see a cook who's putting together some ingredients and creating a meal in 15 minutes. That kind of idea, that turns it into a, a relational experience. <laughs> And I think, as, as uh, I understand it, a number of the big retailers are locked into long-term leases on shops that they otherwise wouldn't keep because most of their business now is online. That will be driven in the public sector by necessity, that there will be an, uh, thinking going into, how can we do this thing differently? And I think the idea of you know, the fulfillment centers, I mentioned that when I was talking earlier, that's an interesting idea, that these are places that people in this community are regularly going to. In the end, everything we buy online, just as every other transaction we do online, has to be fulfilled in the real world. So we need to, as it were, follow the money and see where the fulfillment is. I think we, we need to think about the high streets as part of a neighborhood, part of a broader community, and be designing that sort of shift, that sort of change uh, in, into, into the way we think about them in the future. It won't be shops as they were before, and that's why I kept saying, you know, I don't want to rewind rewind the clock. We've got to think about how we use these places in different kinds of ways. But in the end, uh, online isn't an alternative in the sense that in the end, it, everything has to be fulfilled. There has to be some point at which it enters our real lives, and that's the point at which we can connect with one another. Hello, I'm Emily Bolton from Social Finance. Um, so we've talked a lot or heard a lot about how other people need to change, how the 1950s institutions need to change. But I guess in tr implicit in all of this, if it's about relationships, is also potentially how we need to change as citizens and kind of how our contract with the state potentially needs to change. How do we foster that sort of paradigm shift? Yes, I mean, I, I think it's a bit, as, as John said, that when the space opens up, people crowd in in the way that John was talking about how thousands of people uh, registered to be part of, of the project. And that is my experience, actually. Um, one of the things about Participal was that everywhere we went, we'd have a business case about how these kind of new models would save money, and every, everybody believed the business case. But then when they saw that people would have to be part of doing it, they would say, oh, well, that bit won't work here. You know, that will never work here. And actually... Um, to this day, that, that didn't prove to be the case. So I think, I think that we do want to change, and I don't think it's about other people, and I think that's why kind of David's example of the big lunch is, is so mm. important, because actually when we have those spaces, I don't know if you have a big lunch where you live, but uh, <laughs> you, know, you probably participate, don't you? We all participate. It's just that there are not enough of those spaces, and it's, it's quite hard to get in. It's about the frameworks and the architecture, I think. Hi, uh, Sam Thomas from Making Every Adult Matter. We're a coalition of charities that um, work on behalf of people experiencing the most severe and multiple forms of disadvantage. Um, David, you, you said that some organisations make relationships easier and some make them harder, and I, I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, I think when I think about organisations that I've seen doing brilliant work with people in very difficult situations, often they've allowed people working in, for instance, frontline roles to build very strong relationships with people that they're working with, not, not just kind of at. But one of the things that sometimes makes me uncomfortable about that is that it's always the people in those frontline roles who are responsible for building those relationships, and often they're absorbing the time, the risk, all of the things that go into that. Um, how can we make sure, if we're gonna challenge organizations to think about relationships, how can we make sure that it's people with power who are building those relationships and not just the people who always end up giving extra time, taking on all the stress of it. 
Well, there's a lot in there, but I mean, just uh, two observations. I think part of the answer is, is, is part of what I spoke about earlier, which is how we demonstrate that those kinds of relationships are not just a nice to have, but they enable us to deliver this service better. I, I, I would also uh, j just uh, question uh, the assumption that it is necessarily going to cost more time or cost more money. Uh, a very personal experience. My dad has recently been in hospital, and I'm sure those of you who have uh, uh, experienced the health service very recently will have uh, ha had a very similar experience to me, in that some people in the health service, whether they are serving the food or they're the consultants or whatever they are, some people do this brilliantly. And some people, they don't do it badly, they just don't do it at all. And, and I saw both in the course of very short periods of time. I also saw how everybody who comes into the ward, whether they're uh, cleaning up or the consultant or whoever they are, almost a reflex now, they put that gel on their hands to, to uh, apply disinfectant. It has become a habit. And they do it all the time. If that, that habit can be instilled, it really doesn't take a great deal longer than it to do this thing as to say, good morning, Dennis. You know, to talk to people, to be just a little bit more friendly, to just to begin to build those kinds of relationships. So, so two things: it 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 does it, it does help to deliver an efficient service. It doesn't cost very much to do it. Right, we're at that point in the evening where um, we are racing against the clock. So, what I'm going to suggest is that those of you who've patiently had your hands up, there are two on the front row at the top. Uh, there may be others that we put your questions together um, and we ask each of the panelists to take their pick from those questions before we close. So please be as brief as you possibly can, pass the microphone straight across when you've asked your question and we'll get them all together. Yes sir. Thank you, my name's Nick Wilkie. I'm interested in how you design relationships in without throwing evidence out. I hope you might think it's unfair David but I think community development hasn't always been great at learning lessons from next door. So how do we avoid a situation where we have this sort of bifurcation or zero sum between people who think that social ills can be solved by a randomized control trial and a manualized program on one hand, and community development workers who think that everything about human nature is radically different uh, a mile down the road? And, and how do you find this sensible path between those two positions? Good question. Hi, my name is Sari. Um, Part of the, the idea of like changing the bigger picture and having a more solid understanding of and em emphasize the values of love and care, um, does part of that might that involve changing how we see capital instead of a, um, instead of an end to more a means of getting to other things? Okay, if there's no one else, there's one person here. You had your hand up earlier on, so so the last question. My name is Bailey Aaron. I run a charity called Spark Inside, which brings coaching into prisons. And I'm wondering when there's an instance where there's a, a power dynamic, um, like a prison officer and a prisoner, whereby having a, a meaningful relationship um, between the groups um, for some people um, will run counter to the power that they want to hold over the other group. Um, so I guess drawing from theories of, of social dominance orientation. How do you recommend um, encouraging meaningful relationships be between those groups? Same with police in the community. Um, and um, what, what might, might work for charities and frontline workers that are trying to um, instill more positive relationships? Okay, we got three questions, um, which I take, the first one I take to be, um, is it all about the infinite variability of human nature or is it all, uh, is it all possible to be reduced to a quasi-scientific or randomized control basis? Second one um, is one way to unlock some of this to stop thinking about capital as, as a system and simply think about it as a way of deploying resources, if I understood the second question correctly. And then the third one is, um, uh, what do you do with um, relationships that are inherently asymmetric? Is there a way of tilting them to be, to be more equal? Um, have I done you all justice, those three people? Okay. I'm going to ask each of you to address these. Actually, I'm going to start with you, John. I wish you wouldn't. Really Human nature that. versus <laughs> RCT. <laughs> um, well, I'll give... I just make one point before I... Um, um, I might not be optimistic, but I'm very hopeful. You know, uh, in the sense that my experience at local level 
is that there is this real, real desire for something different. Um, and there is something, if, there, if, and I thought David was searching for a sort of transcendent conversation about what that might be, that gets us out from under the sort of balkanization of the landscape, that searches for some denominators in terms of resetting the public conversation, public policy making, and that's what I found appealing. So don't read that as, as depressing. I, I'm very optimistic. Sorry, I'm not optimistic. I'm very hopeful about that, but I'm not very optimistic about the general environment within which that conversation has to take place over the next couple of years. Um, just in terms of those three questions, because I, I don't want, because I think they're more directed. Those two. I, I was involved in policy making for a few years, a few years ago, um, which didn't work so well, but it allowed me a, uh, a good vantage point in terms of the extraordinary amount of innovative thinking that was occurring, and also the growing evidence base, both domestically and, to, and comparatively. And that's been tapped into with some of the what work centres and some of the more creative parts of um, public service delivery, and especially incubated well in terms of partnerships in and around local government, um, not monopolised by local government, but when they have a, a genuine loosening of the partnerships necessary to lock in uh, longer term policy making uh, at local level. So I am very hopeful that there is the evidence as well as the uh, wherewithal and the memory now actually over the years that can be there to be built once again in that 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 can't be forgotten you know so there is a political act in terms of preserving that memory actually in terms of because this conversation will have to be returned to there will be a desk clearing exercise over the next couple of years and then hopefully we can mainline this conversation back into the center of public policy making because it's not there at the moment but that's why this work is so valuable for the future so david you had a line in your paper about uh, saying zupri about don't teach people to build ships teach them if you want them to build ships teach them to long for the sea yeah. and I, I think that that and that kind of builds on also what john was saying which is what i think is so important in what david set out tonight is a much bigger vision and so, I mean, I, I could kind of go into all three questions, which I think are important and to me very interesting. But I think that if we can kind of keep our sights on the bigger picture, the longing for the sea, we can begin to think, for instance, how the, that relationship might reform itself. Because both of those people, instead of trying to manage the prisoner's condition, for instance, which is what they'll be doing at the moment, will be instead focused on kind of what's the future, where are we heading, how do we want to live, how are we all going to flourish, both the prison worker and the prisoner, because neither are probably flourishing in the, in the current system. It's the same when we try to kind of balance different sorts of evidence, when we use different sorts of resource. And I think the problem at the moment is that we are trying to kind of manage our way out of something. And what David's invited us to do this evening is to imagine and long for the sea. And in that <coughs> bigger imagining, all of us can work these things out. Very good answer. Very good. Uh, well, a few thoughts in response to, to, to Nick, your question. I think, in a, in a sense, your, your question included in a few parts the answer when you talked about how do you balance these things. Um, I, I, I think the, what we've got to try to do is to certain, certainly be better at, uh, as, as, as Hillary has already said, about better at understanding what works and better at deriving appropriate kind of metrics, I think particularly in the third sector but also in the public sector more generally about this kind of stuff. In the past we've been a little bit inclined to say your way of measuring it, you know, put pound, shillings and pence way of measuring it doesn't work full stop rather than saying this is a better way of thinking about it so we've got to do some of that invention for ourselves and if we we are pushing back on some of the metrics that are being imposed upon us then we've got to think of better ones for ourselves so we've got to we've got to be grown up about the need to measure uh, we've also got to try to extract from the work not as I said earlier, not, not the knowledge that we need to industrialize these ideas. Absolutely agree with you, every, every relationship is individual, but the principles, and I do think there are principles here that are likely to be transferable. So I think it is a combination of, of rethinking the metrics in a realistic kind of way, layering into them, and uh, drawing out of that rather the, the, uh, the principles, and then layering over the top of the whole thing. That word that we used earlier about trust. And we've got to be prepared to trust people far more than we do at the moment to, uh, uh, to, to, to get decent outcomes here. I think the point about uh, uh, the, the, the police officer or, 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 the, or the prison warden, uh, 
Um, <clears throat> I think I, I mentioned uh, 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 the importance of rethinking protocols in our organizations, and I think that's what we need to understand we're talking about here. I'm not talking about layering on top a little bit of being nicer to one another. I am talking about really fundamentally rethinking about how these things work. And I think in some contexts, and, and the prison one is probably a good one, job centers are another one. We expect the policing job to be done by the same person as, as is required to do the advising job or the supporting job or whatever it might be. If we think a policing job is required here as, as part of what the state needs to do, then we need to separate that out from the other stuff. And that is what I was talking about around, around protocols. Uh, and, and that really takes me to my, my f f final thought on all this, which is that I think you know, Hillary mentioned earlier about the question about whether the welfare state was, was fit for purpose or not, which is, as, as, uh, as Stefan rightly said, uh, another big issue. Um, but I, I really can't emphasize enough that uh, I think whether it is, it is within this state system or a different kind of one, uh, what I'm talking about here is, is placing relationships at the center of what we do. And that does mean fundamentally rethinking what we do. At a grand level, that might mean the welfare state. At a level at which we can all get our arms around, that means rethinking how we do things in our classroom, in our business, in our neighborhood. And I think that that's the essence of what I was trying to convey here. What can we do to put relationships at the heart of what we do, to make relationships the central operating principle? was the, the phrase I used earlier, whether what we do is design welfare states, run welfare states, or run the nursery classroom. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to attempt a coherent summary of what we've discussed tonight because it's beyond me, but I am going to pick out just two or three things that particularly resonated. Um, I was reminded, um, John, his talk about hopeful versus optimistic, um, Desmond Tutu was asked if he was optimistic, and he said, no, 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 optimists are just bad statisticians. I, I am hopeful. So I don't know if you were intentionally channeling um, Tutu there. Um, I was, Desmond Tutu, I was very struck by the power and elegance of the words that David used, used in his presentation. And I think the gap between um, how people express themselves and what they're expressing has become almost comical. Um, and I think a return to careful, elegant, collective um, phrase making um, really matters because these problems that we describe matter and having only technocratic language for them, um, I think is taking us in the wrong place. And you have only to listen to David talking about the warm web or barefoot design or the longing for the sea to recognize that he's flipped that old stereotype about campaigning in poetry and governing in prose and wants us to govern in poetry. And I can think of no higher praise than that. Um, I think some of the things that Hillary said about the absolute imperative for kind of longitudinal, seriously longitudinal, independent of election cycles or even grant making cycles um, is imperative because we have to have evidence that is not subject to the vagaries of, uh, uh, of short-termism. Um, and so those are the things that really struck me about this evening's conversation. Um, and I wanted to end, um, of course, by thanking David, who's been and continues to be an amazing colleague at the Institute, and of course, thanking Hillary and John for being such um, great panelists, and of course thanking my colleagues in the Institute for making this happen. Um, but slightly less obviously to thank you for being here and for the quality of your engagement and questioning. This is a joint enterprise if it is anything, and it is a co-creation enterprise if it is anything. So we don't know things without you. So thank you. Good night. <laughs>